ahead and call the meeting of our public safety uh, finance and strategic support committee to order and we do have a quorum uh, if we can get a roll call please Corrales here Jimenez Carrasco Carrasco I'll come back I see her on the screen Jones Arenas Arenas, you're still muted. Here. Thank you. Um, going back to Crosco. Okay, so I only have two who have responded. So not a quorum until we know Crosco is at her desk. Oh, Jimenez. Present. Now you have a quorum. <laughs> Thank you. And I the Councilmember Carrasco's uh, mute did go off. Uh, maybe we can just confirm again if she's, I believe she's present. Councilmember Carrasco? I'll text her. Okay, maybe she's having some, some issues, but I did see her, her mute go on and off. Uh, we had a little bit of audio from there. Uh, but we do have a quorum, uh, so thank you. Um, and we have a couple participants uh, in our attendees, um, uh, if you're joining us today by Zoom, uh, you can also join us uh, if you're watching on YouTube or Channel 26. Um, and then if you're interested in submitting a comment, if you're here on our Zoom, you just uh, raise your hand uh, and we'll call on you. Uh, similarly, if you participated in our council meetings, uh, we'll have the timer displayed. And then um, uh, you can also call my by phone um, and um, join in uh, to make a comment there. And that's 888-475-4499. And um, there is uh, ID information uh, located online as well uh, to be able to, to log in either to the, to the Zoom or to call in. Um, and if you're on the phone, uh, you do have to hit star nine to raise your hand to speak. So now uh, we will go to uh, review of our work plan. We don't have anything listed to be added, dropped, or deferred. Uh, are there any uh, changes or desired changes to the work plan from my colleagues? Nope. Seeing none, um, we can get a motion to approve. Move to approve. Second. Okay. Uh, and we'll do, uh, should we do a verbal vote on this one, Tony? Yes. Or Okay, so we'll do a, a verbal vote. Corrales? Aye. Jimenez? Aye. Crosco? Jones? Actually, uh, I just hopped on. I have no idea what I'm voting on. You're... Which wouldn't be the first Hi. time. Hi, Carrasco. <laughs> Carrasco's here. You're voting on um, accepting the work plan and orders of the day. Oh, okay, aye. And Arenas. Aye. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, and then we have nothing on consent, so we'll go right to our first report, which is item D1, and that's our fourth quarter financial report. Oh, actually, I, excuse me. Um, uh, and I, I should have uh, made a mention of this uh, before we did the vote, but, but we are going to allow our fire chief to present first um, because of all the fire incidents that we do have going on uh, at the moment, we'd like to get him uh, back out to uh, work and not in a committee meeting with us. Um, so if there's no uh, objections to that, I don't imagine there will be, uh, then we will hear item D2 first, which is our firefighter safety systems in high-rise buildings report. Thank you very much, Robert Sapien, San Jose Fire Chief. Uh, I believe we had a PowerPoint submitted, if that can uh, be placed on the screen. So Robert, um, I think you, you were supposed to share the PowerPoint for the instructions we sent to your department. When you're on mute, when you're on mute, mute Robert. Okay, that'll take me 20 seconds.
Okay, do we have a screen share? Yes. All right. So uh, as you are aware, the department was asked to analyze whether an alternative to firefighter breathing air systems, uh, such as fire rated elevators, will provide at least equal or better safety to firefighters and residents in high rise buildings. Uh, I wanted to provide a little bit of background to uh, the firefighter breathing air systems uh, or uh, known as uh, FBARs or FARs. Uh, again, firefighter breathing air systems. So what these systems are, uh, are essentially uh, uh, piping uh, and filling stations uh, and equipment uh, that allows us to introduce firefighter breathing air into uh, specific applications. Uh, as you can see on the screen, that includes high rise buildings, uh, buildings where there are two or more floors underground, uh, tunnels greater than 500 feet in length, uh, and where emergency vehicles uh, access points are greater than 150 feet from the entrance to the building. Uh, and so what this does is it provides uh, us with the ability to provide breathing air to fill our self-contained breathing apparatus air cylinders. Uh, the photos on the left uh, include some pictures. The top uh, is the what would be presented at the exterior of a building where it says firefighter air system. Uh, the photo on the bottom left would be a filling cabinet uh, and then some other ancillary equipment uh, you see in the third photo there. Uh, I included a picture of a uh, water uh, fire department connection uh, because these are very similar in the way that they work. Uh, the way we get water into the building from our fire engine pumps is through uh, these fire department connections we would use a fire department apparatus um, to supply air to the FBAR system. Uh, in San Jose, we have 98 existing high-rise buildings. Uh, 13 more are under construction, and we are currently reviewing plans for 39 uh, more high-rise buildings. Of the existing 98 buildings, 11 systems have FBARs installations in them. Uh, and so we have uh, quite a bit of our existing inventory where we do not use, utilize uh, the air systems. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, where they uh, are, uh, the, the other uh, alternative that we were asked to evaluate is fire service access elevators. This is just like any other elevator that you would uh, use in a high rise building, except that it is, uh, strengthened to meet the demands of fire service use uh, in the event of uh, building fires. And so it gives uh, fire department control. There are specific requirements for how the uh, elevator shaft is reinforced and what, uh, is, uh, what is protected by way of sprinklers and, and other requirements. And so this is a requirement in the California Building Code for any buildings that are greater than 120 feet. And again, this is a fire service access elevator. And it is essentially just like any other elevator, but rated for fire service use. Um, here in these three photos, uh, as I said, uh, the FBAR system works a lot like uh, a fire department con connection for water. Uh, in this case, we have a, a breathing air support unit uh, that supplies air to the external connections on the building. Uh, and again, that, that just supplies air so that we can fill air bottles in the building, as you see in the middle photo uh, with the firefighter filling bottles there. And then on the right, again, you see that filling cabinet. Uh, a little bit about the environment that firefighters work in. Of course, we need uh, to port in our own breathing air because a environment where fire is involved, particularly within structures, is uh, uh, immediately dangerous to life or health, uh, not only from superheated gases, but because of the toxicity of the, uh, of the uh, smoke and the lack of oxygen. And so uh, breathing air is extremely important whenever we fight fires, especially in the structural firefighting environment. 
Um, with regards to how we do business, so as I noted, most of our, our 98 existing high-rise buildings do not have FBARs, and so our standard operating procedures uh, presume that there is no firefighter breathing air system nor a fire service access elevator. And so our SOPs uh, require that firefighters bring in extra bottles, as you saw in the previous photo, uh, they port them up stairwells to designated stage, staging locations, which are usually uh, a couple of floors below the fire floor. Uh, and then we uh, are prepared to create a bottle rotation system that would take bottles to the uh, ground level where our breathing air support unit can fill them. And then we provide infrastructure so that bottles can be ported back and forth uh, by way of uh, uh, human resources. Um, the uh, recommendation uh, that we're bringing forward based upon um, the, uh, the internal uh, discussions that we had with our command staff who look at fire uh, high-rise operations uh, is that they could serve as an equivalent uh, or replacement for F-bars for buildings over 75 feet in that we could utilize firefighter uh, access elevators or fire service access elevators to port bottles and equipment and humans. And there are other benefits in that, for example, if we had an injured firefighter, we could use that rated elevator to bring them down quickly. Um, and so the overall recommendation from our uh, folks is that we could um, perform those functions that I just described of, of rotating air bottles effectively uh, with fire service access elevators. Um, I, I do want to, uh, oops, excuse me. I do want to emphasize the second part of that question that we were asked to evaluate uh, with regards to uh, whether these systems are at least equal or better. Uh, I don't think I can come to that conclusion because they are functionally very different. Uh, the FBAR system is kind of a single pur purpose system. It is there to provide plumbed breathing air into the building environment, and that's where we fill our bottles. Whereas Chief, Chief, can I, uh, Chief, I'm going to interrupt you for a second. It looks like your definitions here are reversed. Just for anybody looking at the slide, um, the the F bars definition looks like it's actually the, the elevator definition and vice versa. So uh, just just for anybody looking at the slides, those two definitions are reversed. What you're describing is obviously correct, but the slide is incorrect. I apologize. You're right. I'm looking at that now. Um, so to be clear, so fire service access elevators um, provide just like any other elevator vertical lift and they can they can elevate and lower throughout the building and uh, that gives us the ability to uh, move vertically anything in the building that would fit in the elevator and meet the weight requirements including personnel equipment and air bottles um, versus the uh, F bar system which would be a system whereby we could fill air bottles only. Thank you for catching that. I'm, I'm sorry for that error. Um, and that is the end of my report. Uh, happy to take any other questions. Thank you, Chief. And uh, we do have one member of the public that wants to speak, so I'll, I'll let Blair uh, jump in first before we, and, and uh, it looks like we've got a couple more hands going up. So we'll, we'll do public comment first and then, uh, and then we'll go over to my colleague. And uh, I believe There'll be Mr. city staff yeah, support on it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, Mr. Beekman, you um, can go ahead and start speaking. Thank you. Uh, I think I have my hand up for uh, the previous item, but I, I, if I, my hand is up, I will speak on this item. Uh, sorry for uh, you know the fire situations you have to deal with at this time. Um, I guess good luck in, in, in your efforts, what you can do, what we can all do. And uh, I guess that's all. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Blair. And then uh, next up we have Chris Murphy. Hello, hi, this is Chris Murphy. Are you able to hear me? Hello? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Hi, good, uh, good afternoon, uh, committee members and city staff. My name is Chris Murphy, Vice President, San Jose Firefighters Local 230. Uh, the union that represents the uh, San Jose firefighters. Um, a brief uh, statement, if I may, uh, I wanted to respond to uh, uh, the fire chief's uh, uh, presentation. 
Uh, the purpose of this analysis um, uh, is to answer the question posed by city council, which I'll paraphrase here. Uh, does an alternative to F-bars such as fire rated elevators provide at least equal or better safety to firefighters and residents in high rises? In response to this question, the fire chief concludes in his memo that uh, the elevators and the F-bars are not functionally equivalent, which is what he just stated as well. Uh, it's Local 230's position that removal of the requirement to install F-bars from the San Jose Municipal Code as currently required and as required since 2010 degrades firefighter and high-rise building occupant safety. Uh, there were good reasons to make F-bars a requirement in 2010, and those same reasons exist today. Additionally, if I, if I may, a comment made by the, the fire chief uh, could be uh, uh, misinterpreted as uh, one or the other. My understanding is that... Uh, uh, even if F-bars would be removed from the Muni code, the elevator requirement would still be there. So um, we're going to have the elevator to remove injured firemen regardless. That's, 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 a, that's a requirement. Um, regarding this issue, there's, there, there's, a, there's a lot to it. So Local 230 is respectfully requesting that any final decision on this matter be delayed until such time that we've been given adequate time to further study the issue. That's all I have right now. Thank you. Okay, I don't see any other hands raised. Um, don't believe we have uh, any other calls in. Were there any uh, email requests or questions that came in uh, ahead of time this morning for other public comment? That question was for staff, I believe. Uh, maybe. Kathy, did you receive any any emails on anything coming in? No, I have not, Chair. No, no emails received. Great, thank you. Okay, uh, so we'll close public comment then, and I'll I'll head over to my colleagues, and uh, I'll take the chair's privilege just to ask a couple questions first on on clarification. If you don't mind, Chief, could you pull your slides back up? Thank you. And can you go to the slide that spoke about the, the state requirement on the elevators? Yep. Yeah, so, so is it is it true then it's the case, I guess this is a, a state law that uh, requires this type of elevator, the FSAE um, in these circumstances, right? And, and that would be regardless of what rules we uh, um, uh, impose here in San Jose, we'd have to follow this or developers would have to follow this, correct? That's correct. And if I could take you off this slide for just a moment, I, I wanna point out a distinction. Um, and so uh, the requirement uh, I should have specified for high rise buildings is for uh, buildings over 75 feet. And so what we really are talking about is the distance between 75 and 120 feet and the requirement switching to anything above 75 feet, the, the uh, alternative would be elevators. And, and uh, Chris Murphy was correct that for any building over 120 feet, the, the elevator would be required anyway. And so uh, I, I'm not trying to be argumentative against what he said. I just wanna point out that small distinction of 75 feet uh, would would be where the allowance for uh, an elevator as an alternative would begin. Thank you. That's actually, uh, uh, I appreciate the clarification there. So uh, above 120 feet, doesn't matter what we're saying here, uh, the, the elevators would be required by state law. Um, but between 75 and 120, if we changed our, our regulation, um, then there wouldn't be the requirement of an elevator or the FBAR system. Um, and so there would be sort of that, that interim gap between these, these 75 to 120 uh, foot buildings. So, so I do appreciate with, that. With what we're proposing, the, the, so if, if, we, if there were no change, FBARs would be required above the 75 feet. If, uh, if we move forward with, with uh, the recommendation, then where, elevators were previously not 
required they would be at that 75 foot height. Well, one or the other, correct, is what your recommendation correct, is? Correct, correct. One or the other. Okay. Um, and, okay, I'll, I'll have some more questions. I just wanted that clarification first. So now I'll, I'll jump over to my colleagues, and I see Councilmember Arenas with her hand up. Uh, thank you, Chair. I was um, curious. Um, I, I appreciate the report, and I know that this is a question that we've had in front of us um, last year. I appreciate the, the, the feedback that's come back today. Um, and I'm, I'm glad to see that, um, that our fire union has called in to reiterate their position um, as they represent all of our firefighters. And ultimately they see the, the long-term impacts and effects um, on their uh, physical bodies at the end of their service. And as we've seen many times um, in closed session. And so this for me is, is a, a real concern um, for the safety of our officers, not only in, while uh, they're fighting a, an act of fire, but in the end um, to see what is um, ultimately more beneficial to their um, physical health. Um, and so that this is an investment, um, not only for the safety of that building and for the residents who live there, as well as uh, for our fire department long-term. And so I, I don't see the benefit of, of choosing either or. Um, I, I just, I understand now that anything above 120 feet that you just reiterated um, chair um, and uh, and chief would be a requirement regardless. We don't have to choose. It's not an either or. It's an absolute requirement for the elevators. And, but there's still a question before us in terms of what is that recommendation. And so for me, um, you know, a, as a steward of of our city and our city funding, and in the position we are right now, I I see that the the F bars. Uh, uh, support system is on the development community and the developer who is building that building. Um, and uh, and uh, more of the responsibility um, for the elevators, although they would continue to um, to be the, the, the developer's responsibility, but the ongoing cost of it and and expense to the physical health and um, because we never are sure if elevators are going to ultimately work in the time of crisis or incident and, and it's a good thing that we haven't really explored that just yet because we haven't had that and I'm going to knock on wood as I'm living on the on the edge and the other ridge of of this fire that's ongoing um, just behind us and so this is this is really close right now in terms of what the, the level of devastation it would mean for our family, for our community, and certainly for our firefighters. And so, you know, I'm, I'm gonna support what we currently have now and, and not have any um, alternatives. Um, I don't know that we should um, consider the, the financial um, burden um, on a developer, um, as a significant or the deciding factor, whether we continue with one system or not. I think we ultimately need to keep the safety of our firefighters, of our residents as in the forefront and re really leading with that. Um, and so with the development community feedback that I saw in, in the report, it said that they were, it was difficult for, and I believe it was all anecdotal, uh, but it was difficult for them to qualify with some of the F bars um, uh, to, to include that in their development. Um, but I'm not necessarily inclined to see that as part of our responsibility to consider when we're considering our residents and our firefighters. And so I'm inclined not to um, 
have an either or option at this point and continue with what we have now. Um, and at the very least, I think uh, heed uh, to the recommendation that our uh, the vice president of uh, the firefighters is called in and, and already stated that we could uh, continue to look at this. I don't know that um, the financial implications of a development a de of a developer should uh, completely influence uh, our decision making in terms of uh, the safety systems in place or making any changes at this point. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, and Councilmember Jimenez. Thank you so much. And I guess uh, maybe this question is for the chief or, or really any other staff that's on, on the call, but uh, just uh, touching on some of the things that Councilmember uh, Arena has talked about. Has there been a, a push by developers to, uh, you know, a suggestion that these are maybe too expensive to install and, and, and we should make this change? I'm just curious as to where those comments came from and, and wondering if that's something that we've heard. Yeah, so uh, we conducted, to try to make sure that we heard from stakeholders, we conducted a, a survey of developers to try to understand how they viewed these systems. And we, we queried questions uh, that included both fire service access elevators and F bars. Um, and what I was trying to do is give you as neutral a, a, a response as possible just to the raw questions that we asked about, um, you know, their, their general satisfaction about uh, dealing with the systems, um, what they, what drove their thought processes, that sort of thing. Uh, and ultimately with regards to the evaluation we did as a department for these systems, I didn't factor in any of those concerns, right? Ours, ours are, are basically operational relative to what an elevator does for us operationally and what uh, an F-bar system does for us operationally. But really what we wanted to do was get a balanced sort of data set to understand how that community was feeling because we do very frequently hear from them that, that they have difficulties with one system or another. Thank you for that. And I did note that, I'll just note that, that I think there was a survey and there was about 23 respondents uh, from the, I guess the, well, I'll just call it the high rise community, development community that responded to the survey. And just looking on, I think it's page seven of the, of the report uh, under there, there's a column, uh, the second sort of um, uh, sort of gathering of information. One of them says cost, and it says 22.09 percent. I think you had like 19 respondents. What I was curious about is just the number of respondents. So there were there were 23 total, and all 23 responded uh, and, and made a gave a response as it relates to both F bars. Council member, oh, okay, we we lost your audio for a second there, Councilmember Hernandez. Oh, sorry about that. What would you last here? It was only 30 seconds that we lost. Oh, uh, only 30 seconds. I think that's all of it then. Um, so, so do, do, uh, Chief, uh, if you're still on the call, so page seven, um, it, it tucks, touches on cost, and it has a column for S bar, F bars and F, the elevators. I'll just refer mm -hmm. to it as. And so the number, the 23 respondents responded to uh, both the, the questions as it relates to elevators and F bars. Are those matching or, or were they a distinct or in different uh, number of respondents to those different questions? No, so that, that category, you could select multiple things. And so that's why it's not as easy to clear yeah. to see in terms of the, the other, um, the, the graph above it or the chart above it, which is shows the number of, of, of responses. And so um, with regards to the, the selections, um, the, the uh, developers could pick multiple um, aspects. So that's why it's a little more difficult to understand how many responded. So they can respond to one and not respond to the other and maybe check off vendor options as a concern and then maybe not do it for the elevator section and things that, you know. Right, right. Okay, I understand. Okay. All right. Uh, I guess for me and just this whole conversation, uh, when we're talking about public safety and you know what, you know it well, Chief, uh, for me personally, and I think for the majority of folks that you would ask this question to is, is that the public safety of our first responders should, should take precedent. And so for me, hearing uh, Chris Murphy from Local 230 uh, chime in and, and state, I think his words were removal of FBAR requires, requirements would degrade public, you know, the safety of the firefighters. That's certainly concerning to me. Um, I, I also understand that it probably needs a little bit more study as he also suggested delaying it. 
Uh, I'm wondering if he's, if he's still on the call and if, uh, Chris, if you're still on the call, if you can maybe uh, share how, how much time you think uh, Local 230 needs, uh, certainly as, the, as a representative of the, of the, of the fire uh, department uh, employees, the firefighters, I think for me, and I'm sure for the rest of the committee, it'd be important to hear your perspective uh, with granting you a little bit more time. Hello, are you able to hear me? Yes. Hi, Chris Murphy, a, a local 230. Uh, thank you for the uh, opportunity to respond. Um, just like the rest of the world, uh, you know, our, our members are dealing with uh, with uh, COVID. Uh, we, we currently have the uh, uh, multiple fires and mutual aid responses that uh, our fire chief is, is, is managing. We also had a, uh, a longtime member uh, this last week uh, off duty going to cardiac arrest and uh, uh, he was in critical condition for a while. He's doing, doing better now, but we rallied our resources around him. So this, this was not uh, uh, front and center on our uh, you know, radar screen when we became aware of it. So we, we really didn't have time to adequately study it. Uh, I'm, I'm asking uh, for, for 90 days for us to uh, uh, do some further discussion uh, with the fire chief's office, do some further analysis, and then uh, I'll come back to you with a more uh, uh, comprehensive uh, response. Okay, thank you so much, sir. Uh, those are all my questions. I, I just move a recommendation to uh, bring this back to the committee uh, after 90 days when the local 230 representatives have a, have a better chance to, to understand this a little bit more deeply and give us uh, a deeper sort of explanation as to what their perspective is on this. Second. Second. And uh, okay, thank you. Um, I don't see any other hands raised. Um, and so thank you for the, the comments from my colleagues and the motion here. Um, I appreciate the, uh, the dialogue as well. And uh, thank you, Chris, for being able to respond. I know that the, um, you know, sort of the, the, the recommendation here um, has just come out 10 days ago. Uh, I am aware, Chief, obviously you, you put it in the report uh, in your outreach to Local 230, and um, I appreciate, though, them saying they would like some more time to be able to, to themselves maybe provide more feedback and make a recommendation. Uh, it's important to me uh, that uh, Local 230 gets that opportunity to do so, so I will support this motion uh, allowing this item to come back to this committee before we move it forward to uh, the council for recommendation. And um, just to get into some of the, the, the concerns um, and, and, and appreciate the, the report on it, Chief, and the, the presentation. Um, would you say if we had, uh, and this would be for buildings 75 feet and over, so both the 120, but also 75. Um, would it be the best, and I'm thinking about things like when you go to apply for insurance for your car, say, and you have the different varying options of liability, you know, uh, maybe, uh, you know, a, a, a collision and comprehensive coverage, and then, you know, you go from 100, 300,000, you know, 200, 500, 250, 500, you start to go up and your deductibles go down and then you get uninsured motorists on top of that. There's sort of these different <laughs> levels, right? Um, would you say that it would be the safest to, to have both sy systems installed rather than this initially what the question was is, hey, is one better than the other? Which as you point out in your report, um, you're saying you can't definitively say that um and and so would you say though that that having both of these con considering that they are com you know kind of totally different you have an elevator system and then you have uh the fr system would you say both of those both combined is the best I, I would say for what firefighters confront um we we meet those challenges with people and with tools and so the more people the better the more tools the better and, and i would say you know straight answer to your question would be if, if both uh, FBAR systems were always present and both and, and uh, fire service access elevators were always present, that would be sort of the Cadillac model, right? We'd have all options uh, at our fingertips. Okay, and in addition, I think uh, Local 230 uh, 
must have stated this because you put it in your report that, uh, and you just mentioned it right now, one of the other elements not to be forgotten is just staffing, right? It's just the personnel, the actual bodies to respond to a call. And um, I think, and I'll, I'll pull it up real quick, but you talk about how um, a high rise fire and you've got uh, the standard operating practice is a level three, three alarm. Um, you have 91 personnel, approximately 50% of on duty resources. And that uh, certainly that puts a huge strain on the rest of the city. And then if you go beyond that, we need to go to mutual aid. So I think it shouldn't be forgotten in that regard as well, right? That that personnel is is really the first key, you know, key part of combating any of these high-rise fires, and your current standard operating uh, procedures are actually to assume that there is no F bars or no uh, uh, fire safety elevator because a number of our buildings don't have them today, and uh, and you have so you have to have that as your 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 base standard operating procedure. But I do look at that as the liability option in insurance, right? I look at that as you have minimum staffing going in, uh, you deplete the resources throughout the rest of the city, and your, your SLP is the worst case scenario because we have the worst case scenario in, some, in, in many instances. Um, so I think that's the right SLP, and I think um, certainly, right, we should be training and, and prepared for that. But that shouldn't be what we aim for for our future, and we have to realize that the policies we put in place today uh, will change and map out what our high rises uh, look like, right? 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now. And uh, and hopefully at some point, right, we, we do have the Cadillac version where we know it's not just about, um, you know, for our, for our firefighters, but it's about the safety of the people that are actually living in or working in these high rises, right? And giving them and our firefighters the best ability, the best opportunity um, to to survive an incident like that. And, um, and and the building itself as well, right? The, the, the structures that people invest in heavily. Um, and so that's, that's sort of one of my, has been one of my main concerns and interests. I definitely uh, was interested in what local 230s opinions were gonna be uh, on this as well as yours. And, um, and you know, I, I think certainly at the end of the day, I, I, I'm still gonna lean on this. Um, I guess this Cadillac version, as we call it, but you know the idea of what would be the safest, uh, you know, tools and resources possible, um, and and then anything that we are, you know, limiting from there, we just have to recognize that if we're limiting that, um, you know, be realistic on the fact that that may not be the best for both our firefighters and our residents, uh, and realize what the trade-off is, and if the trade-off is that it's you know, because it's costly uh, to developers or it's, uh, you know, deemed ineffective and or costly to maintain, whatever it may be, I think we just have to be realistic about that. And we can have those conversations here um, and maybe we can have them more thoroughly in uh, three months. And so um, I will ask if uh, Local 230 can can ensure that we can come back within uh, the 90 day time frame. I, I don't want to kick this out too long. It has been going on for some time. Um, and so I'll, I'll just, uh, uh, I'll, I think Chris is still on. So Chris, uh, if, if staff, if you can unmute him, um, just want to make sure that we can, we can stick to that timeline. 90 days is, is a longer time frame. Um, uh, I would like to get this heard in, in a recommendation to the full council before the end of the year, even if we hear it in the beginning of next year, but the 90 day time frame would allow us to do that. So uh, sure. Chris, go ahead. Chair Corrales, just um, I'm looking at the work plan. It, I would recommend that it, if we're going to do 90 days, it'd be slightly more due December 10th because the November 19th date is pretty full um, with a bunch of police items. So I would recommend December 10th. So at night, it's a special meeting at 9:30, so it's a little earlier in December, and to see if that would be where everybody would be ready and they know okay. the date we're shooting for. So that's even a little longer than 90 days. Um, Chris, how, how does that sound to you for December 10th? Uh, yes, Chair Perales, that sounds fine. Thank you very much for your consideration. Okay, sounds good. Um, and Chair, then do, having- Chair, oh, do, you yeah. recommend, do you recommend specifying that date in the motion or just- uh... Yeah, yeah, you can uh, specify that in the motion. Okay, so we'll just amend that to the, mo amend the motion to, to be specific about that date. Okay, and then Council Member Adena, did you have another follow-up? 
or maybe your actually, hand was just up. Oh, go yeah, ahead. actually, I, I didn't, but uh, thank you, Chair. I, um, I did want to talk a little bit about the, the um, financial implications of the of the systems. Um, uh, and I don't know that it, maybe I missed it in the report. I don't know if we could take a look at what the costs are for each of those systems. Um, because I think when they asked about, um, excuse me, uh, about competitive, uh, a competitive bid for, for both the F, FRs and the FSAE, um, and I don't know how to say these acronyms. I don't know if I'm saying it right. I'm calling it FRs. I don't know if you all are saying it differently, but that's what it's coming down to. Um, so I, I'd like to see maybe more concrete um, numbers for for um, what what is the financial implication for a building when you uh, take either option or when you have to take both, or um, the financial implication for our department in assuming that uh, most buildings in the downtown area or in our city don't have um, what they need and what we have to do to to adapt. And so Thank hoping you. that that could come back um, in December with that report. And so we can see if we can include that in the motion, but I'll ask the chief, did you uh, gather any of that data in the outreach that you did with the development community? Um, we uh, did capture um, in, in terms of the, the questions that that issue of, of competitive bidding came up anecdotally over a few years um, and in the survey um, we did dig a little deeper and found that there we, we could only find two vendors and one of them was exclusive to the state of Texas and so you can imagine um, perhaps where a little bit of the frustration comes from for for the developers in that case okay so you have one vendor truly then then you don't have much competition um, in, in bids uh, okay, but you don't have any of the uh, cost data, um, so I don't know exactly, um, you know, who would lead on trying to get that, but if we included that in the motion, um, how, what, the, yourself or, or staff, how do you feel uh, in regards to being able to, to produce that? The, the difficulty of, of that, I think, is um, it, it becomes circumstantial to the structure in a lot of cases. And so per square foot costs, for example, um, if, a, if a building is, is going to uh, be required to have fire service access elevators, they might just use their normal, um, uh, normal occupant traffic elevators and convert them or upgrade them to fire service access. And that might be a marginal cost. Whereas in some applications, they may add an entirely new elevator uh, shaft and, and that's an entirely different cost. So I, I, I may not be the one to speak to that um, in terms of what the, the exposure is to developers. Um, and I think just hearing some, some particular uh, feedback on FBARs, very similar is that the design concerns of, of adding the system and closets and cabinets mm -hmm. um, is, is another addition to the building and, and it, 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 it's varied for each application. So I, I would really have to get my mind around how I might come up with some cost per square foot and we don't even have that much experience I think to give us a good average, I guess would be a concern. Yeah, that was just, you know, my initial concern as well would be, I don't know if tasking this to you is the right, um, you know, group to task it to, uh, considering you're not in the business of paying for it, right? We're in the business of requiring it or not, and then the developers have been paying for it. And so um, I think that might be an additional challenge. I don't know if Councilmember Renes, you wanted to follow up on that, and then um, we can hand it over to Councilmember uh, Jimenez. I think you wanted to chime in. Sure, I, I think it could be loosely based and I certainly wouldn't uh, uh, look to um, hold our chief um, to, to the, his feet to the fire uh, based on he's not in this industry and, um, and I know that every building is different, the costs are different. I mean, it's just so unique, every development is unique. Um, and I guess what I think we could quantify on our end is the cost that it 
takes uh, for us to be prepared regardless of the of the systems, right? I mean, there's always a cost um, and, and, uh, and what does that cost to the city of San Jose? And so I, I think it, it's, it, may, it, it won't be apples to apples, it won't be comparative, but at the very least we can see what um, each of those uh, auctions uh, uh, represents for us in terms of how we prepare for a call. I, I think right now we have a default to assume that uh, none of these build, uh, buildings or high rises has um, the elevators or uh, the F bars. So we take uh, our own equipment, the own scuba uh, uh, tanks, and um, and I think just the cost to have that at on site would um, would also be significant to us because it it does represent a future cost to the city if we go um, uh, completely elevator option, right? It continuously comes back to the city as a cost. Currently, we do have a cost, but now we're going to assume that if uh, new buildings only are going to have the elevator option, then that, that's uh, uh, possibly a new scenario that now we're going to be able to um, assume from here on based on the decision of the council. Yeah, I, I guess I'd be interested in, in maybe um, if it were a narrow question about what are the um, potential cost considerations relative to fire department costs, I, I think I might be able to provide, I, I will tell you it'd be highly debatable and, and this was a, a, a passionate discussion in some cases where some, some argued that the value of an elevator is that we don't have to port equipment upstairs, which is very tedious work and, and very taxing. Um, and then there's the other side of the argument of, of folks who feel passionate that they want air throughout the building available to fill bottles. And, and that's just a different approach, but um, right. it, it's, it's, uh, it, it would be difficult to put a, 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 a price tag to, but we could in the abstract, talk, you know, I, I could offer right now in the abstract, I could say, could there potentially be injury prevention benefits to an elevator? I would say, yes, there probably are because we're not porting, physically porting equipment up and downstairs. Um, could I say that, that there are uh, efficiencies to having uh, air filling happening in the building? Uh, I would say yes, but I could also go the other way and say, I'm still, uh, you know, dependent on a street side apparatus um, to do, to perform that. And I only have two of those in the city, which, which you know, that's a challenge too. So it, it's a, a, a lot went into this very simple <laughs> document in terms of, uh, of looking at the operation um, overall. And not a simple document at all. I know there was a <laughs> lot, uh, a lot of implications in, in every page and, um, and certainly a lot of consideration on your part. So any way we, we can quantify the resources that we have to expend on a call, uh, that would be great. Uh, whether it's additional, um, uh, what do you call them? The tanks, the, they are called scuba tanks, right? Uh, Self-contained breathing apparatus cylinders, right? right. Or tank, tanks. <laughs> I'm just gonna call them tanks because now, uh, yeah, we're, we're gonna say that we're scuba diving here. Um, so whatever the cost is for us to bring in additional uh, tanks, uh, because there isn't a filtration system uh, set up in the building, whatever it is, whatever factors into making a decision when you go out into a call, and I'll leave it up to you to decide uh, the specifics on that. I just want us to be able to quantify this in some, some very general way or very specific uh, scenario, if that's what you choose to do, um, to, to have some some level of comparison. Um, that's really all uh, I was hoping that we could do so we can see what the expense is uh, to the city uh, versus when we don't, um, when we um, have a building that's already prepared for us to just hitch our wagon to. Thank you. That's where we're committed. Uh, I just had a thought, I mean, uh, Chief, would, would it be, um... I assume it'd be relatively easy for you to reach out to maybe the Office of Economic Development, some of the folks that do a lot of the work with the developers and the high-rise community to just 
in, you know, inquire or see if they have any thoughts or information. I, I, I don't know if that's may, may be a relatively easy, easier ask to make. Uh, so it takes it off your plate, but gives it to some of the folks that are actively engaged with these folks day in, day out. Just, uh, just uh, Happy to do that. The, 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 the list of 100, and I think it was 150 uh, developers that we got, we actually got from economic development to try to make sure that we did reach um, as far and wide as we could. Um, and, mm -hmm. and so we can certainly continue that dialogue. Yeah, because I because I think I mean the experience on the city council is that the developers are often very vocal about uh, challenges and getting things built and 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 cost prohibitive type of requirements, whether it be fees or whatever it may be that the city imposes. Uh, and so I suspect that there's probably a list somewhere uh, of the costs associated with this and maybe some concerns from them. So. Uh, I'd like to think something already exists, but that, that may be worthwhile. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And, and I actually like uh, the conversation Councilman Rodenas was having, uh, Chief, with you that, that I think there's two costs here, right? There's the one cost on the developer, which maybe we can get some information from OED. Um, but I think more importantly would be, yes, is there a differentiation in cost on the, these systems to us, right? Whether it's training, um, the bottles, the, um, uh, you know, the way that we need to interact with these uh, devices. And so that would be, you know, uh, and it may be negligible, who knows, but I think that would be important to kind of see that on, on your end. Um, so we have a motion and uh, we'll be coming back in December and uh, I think it's December 9th, correct? And, uh, and then it will include this, this additional analysis. It's December 10th. I'm sorry, December 10th. Thank you. Okay, no further comments or questions. If uh, we can take a roll call vote. Morales? Aye. Jimenez? Aye. Roscoe? Aye. Thank you. Jones? Aye. Look, uh, sorry, I'm so used to saying his name last, Arenas. Aye. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you, Chief. Um, and uh, obviously, um, you know, all of, uh, all of our firefighters, uh, everybody out there in Cal Fire, everybody uh, are in our, our thoughts and prayers. Um, so thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, and um, we'll go to our next item. I'll take a brief, uh, interesting pause. Uh, Councilmember Arenas and I are both wearing Viva Calle shirts, slightly different years, but uh, showing, our, showing our pride of... <laughs> randomly un, un, unplanned um we, we just happen to have different um virtual backgrounds yeah. mine's mine's a toy story <laughs> mine's my fake loft um <laughs> okay so now we will go back to uh, uh item d1 which is our fourth quarter financial reports for uh fiscal year 2019-2020 okay um good afternoon um Chair and members of the committee, Julia Cooper, Director of Finance. Um, I'm going to apologize to start off with. I'm gonna tee up the presentation, but I'm gonna to have to jump off because um, I have a rating presentation scheduled with S&P that starts at 2.30 and I'm the lead off. Um, so I don't wanna be late with that because obviously we don't wanna impact our ratings for our upcoming bond issues. So um, with that, um, we, and Nikolai Skarloff, who is our new Deputy Director for Debt and Treasury Management, just started um, at the end of June. Um, he'll be jumping off as well because he's working on the rating presentation as well. But we also have um, Luz Kostrisky, how our Assistant Director, who will take over, along with Chin Yu Sun, who's making the bulk of the presentation. So as customary, um, the information on the revenue um, management and debt management is included in the packet for your information. We only do the slide presentation on the investment portion of the, of the report. Um, in order to be in compliance with our investment policy, we do that with the second and fourth quarter reports. Um, so we'll start with the slide deck um, that's on um, page 10, which is the fourth quarter um, report for fiscal year 20. So um, the investment policy conforms with the, oh, do we have it up? Somebody's, who's putting up the slide deck? I'm looking at my colleagues and, okay, Chin Yu's got it up. Thanks, Chin Yu. Okay, so, um, and then we start on slide 10, which um, has the, um, 
the um, investment policy conforms with the government code. Um, our authorized investments only include high grade fixed um, income securities. Um, the policy is reviewed annually, which is um, in, with a, in conjunction with the second quarter report. So you see that at the February um, um, committee meeting and is adopted uh, by the council. And additionally, the investment program is audited semi-annually for compliance purposes. So the next slide, we continue to uh, manage our investments to meet the objectives of safety, liquidity, and yield. And the yield component is becoming increasingly more challenged in this interest rate environment. Chin Yu will talk to that a little bit. And then the quarterly reports are online, put on the committee agenda, and then also separately set uh, agendized for the council meetings. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Chin Yu and Luz, and you're in good hands and uh, I'll talk to with you later, thanks. Thank you, Julia. Um, so I'll continue on with the presentation for the last quarter's performance. As of June 30, 2020, the, the, uh, the city's portfolio was just a little shy of $2.4 billion. Um, the earning interest yield for the quarter was 1.974%, uh, um, quite a bit lower from the last quarter. As we all know, the interest rates have been dropping since the late part of uh, 2019. And we did average days to maturity at the end of June was 672 days, a few days shorter than the last quarter, last at the end of last the quarter prior previously, uh, it was a 685 days. Um, fiscal year to year to date net interest earning was a 40. $45.9 million, which is the highest in my tenure with the city of San Jose. Um, last, in the previous fiscal year, in FY 18-19, the portfolio earned the city $35 million. So we actually increased the earning in this fiscal year by over $10 million. Um, for the quarter, there was no exception to the city's investment policy. This is a, a, a picture, a, a chart for to describe what security this, the portfolio has been invested in. So, 34% uh, of the security, 34% of the portfolio was invested invested in governmental securities, including agencies and treasury. Um, 80, 8% oh, of the portfolio was invested in supranationals. Um, and then about 43% of the portfolio was invested in credit sectors, which include the CDCP, corporate notes, and municipal bonds. Uh, we, as you all know, we started investing in mortgage-backed security, asset-backed security uh, about uh, over half a year ago. Um, so as of the end of uh, this, uh, this quarter, we have about 8% of the portfolio invested in asset-backed security and the mortgage-backed security in total. Um, uh, this chart shows uh, oh, which, uh, which, what funds are invested in the city's portfolio. Um, the red, part, red portion indicates the general fund. At the end of the quarter, the general fund has a balance $665 million in the portfolio, which represents about 26% um, of the portfolio. Um, general fund balance increased by um, over $378 million in the quarter. Um, this really caught, was called contributed by the receipt of the Coronavirus Act funding in April, which was about $178 million. And also a property tax in June, we received $181 million in property tax in June. Um, we estimate for the next six months, we, we have enough uh, investment maturities revenues uh, to cover the anticipated expenditures. The revenue maturity uh, were, has been estimated to be at $1.8 billion. Um, and then the expenditures was estimated a little bit uh, just about that. Um, $1.79 billion, a little bit lower than the revenues and maturities. And this chart shows the trend of the uh, bond balance developed over the last two years. As you can see, generally, the general fund balance increasing in, in 
in January and June when we received the bulk of the property tax and it decreased uh, during the summer months when we do not receive a, um, we do not have a lot of cash receipts coming in. And then you for this year because of the uh, pre-funding, so in the next quarter re re uh, report, you will you will likely see a, a steep drop in general fund balance. So you'll see a, a, a kind of a trough looking on the red line. That red line is the general fund. Um, this chart compares the city portfolio performance with uh, LAIF and then uh, Bank America and, and one two three year triple AA um, index. As you can see, over the last two years, uh, we have um, the blue line is the city portfolio. Um, we generally uh, we overperformed the LAIF um, since August 2019, and then the spread between uh, LAIF and our portfolio has been it has been widening over the uh, over the last uh, uh, year or also. Um, the the variance between um, our portfolio and uh, the Bank of, Bank, of Mar Bank of America Merrill Lynch index has also been narrowing. Um, at the end of uh, June uh, 30th, as you can see, the city's portfolio has a yield portfolio has an aggregated yield to maturity at 1.88 percent, and average daily maturity was 678 days. Um, uh, going forward, we'll continue our strategy to match, um, uh, as, as always, we'll match the investment maturity with known expenditures within the next 24 month horizon. We will strategically uh, expand a portion of the portfolio beyond the two year horizon when appropriate to provide income and structure to the portfolio. We will maintain the diversification of the portfolio. As always, we'll focus on, on the core mandates of safety safety, liquidity, and yield. And that ends up my um, presentation. So if there are any questions or concerns. Uh, is this the end of all the presentations? It is. Or? The, the okay. remainder of the remainder of the packet, uh, remainder of the reports, the debt, the debt report, and the revenue management report are in your packet as always. Okay, thank you. And thank you. Um, I will go to our public. Uh, I don't see anybody. Oh, I see uh, Blair Beekman. Just give me a second. I need to stop the, sh the screen sharing. Okay. Okay, Blair, go ahead. Hi, thank you. Uh, for this item, um, thank you for, you know, the very detailed uh, budget reporting here. Um, I'm pretty impressed. I think for a beginner to understand where our city is at, uh, it can be of a lot of help. Thank you. Um, it doesn't mention much at all about policing within that part of the budget, which is a bit confusing to me. And for yourselves to, you know, make off these incredible budget plans within the framework of policing, you know, can be seen as a bit offensive if you consider what, you know, we're trying to work towards at this time. I mean, I appreciate the efforts a lot. I mean, you make help make things clear, but to help make things clear through the police department, I think can make people uncomfortable. And I just wanted to point that out. Um, you know, uh, we're a part of important efforts right now, uh, really reassessing how we think of things. And I, and I don't want to hurt those efforts at all at this time. Um, Sergio Jimenez and uh, Jennifer McGuire at, at the four items of police matters on Tuesday, very nicely talked about uh, how they can look into actual police budget matters in what they called uh, the budget book. It was a strange term, but they, they spoke of it a few times at about three hours and 55 minutes exactly. And uh, with my remaining 30 seconds, um, can that book, budget book, as you called it, can that be made public? Can, are those are the sort of stats that I think we want to see what is going on with the police at this time. And that you usually do have your fourth quarter reports uh, at this PISPIS that talk about police budget matters, I believe. So um, uh, if you can explain that, uh, what's different this time, uh, 
I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Ra Raul, maybe I can just for the public's um, Go ahead. aware. Um, so um, you can find the, the, the budget book is really the uh, proposed and adopted budgets. You can find them on the city's website and they're very detailed. They're uh, they have an operating and a capital budget book. They're over a thousand pages each. And so they are open to the public where um, we go more detailed than most cities. And you can certainly look at the police department in full. You also can look at how the police department's performing with their budget uh, as part of our bi-monthly finance reports that are heard by this committee uh, four times a year, as well as our annual report that's heard by the council in September um, and our mid-year budget review that's heard by the council in February. So there's lots of, there's, there's very public information on our budget and our monitoring of it. Thank you. And um, I believe that's it for our public speakers. I do see somebody on the phone. And so I'll just remind you, if you did want to speak and you're on the phone, you can click star nine. And that's how you'll raise your hand. And then we'll list off your last four digits and, and if you wanted to speak. Um, and thank you, um, Jennifer, for, for uh, mentioning that. Um, and I was just going to mention as well to, to Blair's comments that um, these are our investment reports. Um, this is it's so it's specific to how we are investing the dollars for each different pot of money that we have, sort of where they sit in the meantime before we use them. Um, so it's not as specific as you know the use of them and how you know each department is using those. And specifically, the police department's budget is actually within the general fund dollars. So you you wouldn't see a separate piece of the pie uh, labeled police budget um, that would fall under the, the, the general fund uh, piece of the pie in the, in the image that you saw. Um, and, and that would be the same for all other things funded by the general fund. You wouldn't see that a, a denotation of, of them uh, with their own little slice. And um, let me go back to my colleagues. I don't see any hands raised. I just had uh, one question and that was, uh, well, I, maybe, question slash comment um, slide that made me happy. It said that um, the projected investment maturities and revenue are sufficient to cover anticipated expenditures for the next six months. Is that an indication of, of stable times ahead? Uh, I know that we're going to be talking about our, you know, sort of our, our budget uh, through a, a mid you know, check that, that we don't traditionally do. Um, and there was the nervousness, I think, right, that there, there may be deeper cuts and potentially even uh, salary cuts or, or layoffs, There's a, you know, looming of, of what, what may be to come. Is that a, is that a positive indication for us? Uh, Go ahead, Chinyo. And uh, um, we, uh, the invest it's not really indication of the revenue um, by itself. Uh, we gen because of the city's uh, revenue comes in in as a not 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 even now throughout the year, so the investment program uh, does a, a does a significant amount of job just to move out the cash flow. So when we receive more revenues, uh, such as January and then June, we usually invest the money we don't need at that time to target the time frame that the city needs money. So when we say the state code requires all local agencies uh, to report cash flow information for the next six months, and which is also a requirement our policy, we are required to provide sufficient liquidity for the city. So every six months we have to check if whether our investment, investment maturities in in combination with uh, revenues anticipated are sufficient, in, uh, sufficient to cover anticipated expenditures. Uh, so that's why it's always included in the presentation and always included in our reports. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Um, so we, we obviously still have uh, some, some important conversations coming up. It's, it's not as exciting as an announcement as I, I was look, reading it on the, on the slide. Um, Okay, I don't have any other comments or questions. If there's none, uh, if we can get a motion um, to approve. Motion to approve. Second. Second. Okay, we have uh, Council Member Adenis with the motion and Council Member Jimenez uh, beating uh, Council Member Jones to the second. 
and uh, we now Close. do a, ro a roll call vote. Morales? Aye. Jimenez? Yes. Morocco? Yes. Jones? Aye. Arenas? Aye. Thank you very much, uh, Tony. And I thought, uh, you know, I'd get the privilege of the mayor and being the last person to vote as the chair. Um, so I'm just you gonna, should, but I'm I would just copy that off the agenda. I'm just giving you a hard time. Um, and we'll go to open forum and I see Blair. Hi. Uh, I'm sorry if I overreacted a bit. I, I don't know if that's usually the standard how you give a uh, fourth quarter, if you give your quarterly budget reports with such an overall view of the city budget. Uh, boy, I've been doing this for five years now. And I'm really sorry that I, I, I didn't pick that up. Um, you know, if that's a standard practice, you know, that's one thing. And it does mention that with such great practices that you offered and, and shared what the budget, where the budget is, I mean, it was great. Why is that in the police matters, you know, uh, security matters? I guess, you know, that's part of the Pittsburgh's name, but uh, it's a bit worrisome. So I guess that's what we're doing now is debating about these things. Um, with uh, a minute 20, or reviewing these things, with a minute 20, I wanted to think about, uh, you know, the, the meetings on, on, uh, on Tuesday, I hope everyone noticed the open forum after the four items. You know, I felt that's a real uh, vital resource for our future. And, and whenever we have trouble looking up items or studying items and the bureaucracy that, you know, there's gonna be a ton of bureaucracy right now to figure things out. And when that starts to get overwhelming, I hope you can just review the uh, open forum time of last Tuesday. Uh, what is that, August, 6th, August 18th. Because I think the people really just, they needed answers. They needed to be talked to in humanistic terms. And the mayor, for all his hard work, and the city council, you talked in very strict bureaucratic terms that really locked out the humanity of what needed to be talked about in these issues. I mean, really at a time to talk about community policing and how equity can have a, a major part in that process. And it just felt really uncomfortable in, in, in terms of how you're talking about it. It gets some getting used to by all of us, but I hope you can be aware of what we're, we're really coming from as, as community persons. Thank you. Thanks, Blair. Uh, next up is Crystal. Hi, my name is Crystal Campisi, and I'm a senior and a medical marijuana patient. And today I would like to respectfully request a referral back to staff to consider waiving the marijuana business tax for medical marijuana card holders. Medical patients right now are paying close to 35% tax on their medicine. This is more tax than alcohol, gasoline, or tobacco taxes. And these people have prescriptions for medications. These are people with cancer and chronic pain. Prescriptions by law are not subject to taxation, but somehow we got caught up in being taxed for our medicine. This 35% tax is having an effect. It's taking patients, taxing patients like me out of the ability to be able to afford my own medicine. And this is especially true during this time of COVID. We just can't afford this 35% tax. And it's driving medical patients underground to the black market where cannabis is untested and unsafe. Remember that vape scare we had last year? That's untested products. It's putting our aging and most vulnerable communities, our sick communities at risk. This is a public safety issue. What we'd like to do is waive the MBT for cardholders, get patients back into the dispensary to safer medicine at a more reasonable tax rate. And I would love it if a committee member would champion this referral for me. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Crystal. And uh, I think our last public speaker is a phone caller with the last four digits of 5140. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I think that you should tax marijuana more and fix all the potholes 
and the, the roads that have been in disrepair for the last 20 years. It's disc- these roads are disgraceful. It's like a third world country. I'll bet you Somalia has better roads than we do here in the city of San Jose. Secondly, we, we need to uh, fix the Rose Garden, get rid of the graffiti. This is pointed at Deb Davis if she's around. Graffiti on the garbage cans, not enough garbage cans, and the fountain is broken. During this time when it's so hot, you go to the Rose Garden to cool off and the fountain's broken. I mean, this is third world. The grass of the Rose Garden needs to be repaired, as does the sidewalks around there that have that are raised sidewalks that you could trip on. And if you make residents fix the, the sidewalks in front of their house, the rose garden and the sidewalk around the rose garden should be absolutely perfect. Also, the, the, the street lights, the green street lamps are, are not green anymore. They're orange brown because of rust. They either need to be removed or repainted and, and it's a disgrace. It looks like a third world country in, in this city, and people are worried about smoking marijuana. Uh, wasn't that the whole idea? Was to tax marijuana for 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 a revenue stream? Guess what? It should be fifty five percent. That person is calling up if they're doing it because it's for their medical care. They want that to be able to get high cheaper. Let it go underground, as far as I'm concerned. Thank you. Okay, and that's it for our public comment, and uh, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you.